All right, well, good evening. Uh, my name is William Garvin. I'm the director of the F.W. Olin Library. Uh, and on behalf of the F.W. Olin Library at Drury University, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth annual Morrison Lecture. Uh, today, this very day, we celebrate the 28th anniversary of the dedication of the Olin Library. And um, given the topic of tonight's lecture, I might also note that this Saturday will be the 112th anniversary of the death by shooting of Calvin Finkel, who was killed just behind this building on Halloween night uh, in 1908. Uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Dana Coleman, and I first met Dr. Coleman on July 20th, 2019, in Eastern Germany, and it was my first day as a volunteer working on an archaeological excavation to recover the remains of an American airman uh, who was killed in World War II. And the site was an old uh, uh, German airfield, an old Luftwaffe airfield, uh, that the Americans had attacked very late uh, in the war, and this young man had uh, been shot down. And as I was digging in, there was an old air raid um, shelter trench uh, right on the edge of the airfield, and uh, uh, I was excavating in that point, and uh, I was working with a young man named Cody who was sifting the dirt uh, that I was removing. And we did this for several hours. It was very hot that summer, very dusty. Uh, we did this for several hours and didn't find anything until finally Cody sort of straightened up and said, hey, hey, I think I, I found something here. Yeah, I think this is a piece of bone. And he called for a forensics expert to come over and take a look at it. And Dana Coleman was the closest. So she came over and examined the piece and she looked at it and said, yeah, that, that's bone, that's bone. And we got very excited, and she said, yeah, bone. And then she added, porcine, juvenile. So Cody and I were the proud discoverers of a rib bone from a young pig, uh, probably somebody's uh, dinner scraps. Dr. Dana Coleman is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminology at Towson University in Maryland. She holds a bachelor's degree in anthropology from Towson University, a master's degree in forensic science from George Washington University, and a doctorate in anthropology from American University. She worked for over a decade as a crime scene investigator for the Baltimore County Police Department and has worked in a number of places around the world recovering human remains, including Mayan sites in Guatemala, and modern sites in Germany, the Balkans, and Tarawa Atoll in the Pacific. She also works as a forensic anthropologist with the National Disaster Medical System and has recently done work in this capacity in California, Georgia, and New York related to the pandemic. As a teacher, she gives her students real world experience in the search for and recovery of human remains. And to date, she and her students have worked on dozens of cases, and the majority of those cases have resulted in the recovery of remains. She is the author of Never Suck a Dead Man's Hand, Curious Adventures of a CSI, which will be re-released in paperback this spring. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dana Coleman. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for, for having me, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what forensics is, how TV differs from the reality of the job. Um, I think I can sum that up by saying I never would have quit if it was like TV. Um, and then I just want to talk about thinking outside the box, which I think is one of the hardest things to teach, but one of the most important things that you can do as a forensic scientist. So 
I'm going to dispel, first of all, a couple of the myths and rumors that we see in, um, in some of the television programming. So, I mean, we don't eat at crime scenes. We certainly don't dress like this. And when I look at uh, that ensemble right there, I can't help but think of the time when I, um, I was doing a search warrant on a dumpster. We were looking for evidence, and I got home from work, and I took off my uniform shirt, my bulletproof vest, took off my underwear, I got in the shower and found a maggot in my bra. So I can only imagine what she's got going on under there. <laughs> so this is how we really dress, far different than what you see, it, see on television. Um, crime scenes that we handle are not in multi-million dollar homes like you will frequently see on TV. Um, there's no place like home. There's no place. I mean, it's so bad that sometimes you're afraid to put the camera case down because you're afraid something's going to lay eggs in it. Um, on, in real crime scene investigations, we don't handle just who done it murders. We handle burglaries. We handle child abuses, um, suspected child abuses that sometimes a child will go to the other parent and come home with a skin knee and the other parent claims it's abuse. We still document what we find. We let courts and social services and the police work that out at the end. But we handle arsons and burglaries and sexual assaults and um, we draw a line so we don't handle thefts from auto and things like that that would take up a lot of time. But we handle a lot more than just murders. Um, dead people aren't pretty. Um, this is actually a pillow that you can buy somewhere that I th think I've got to have that for my sofa. Um, but, you know, decomposition is a bad thing. And, you, and let me preface this by saying that I do have some photographs in here that are maybe considered a little bit graphic. I don't know. My barometer is pretty low. But um, I know there's some young people in the audience, so I, I tried to keep it pretty clean. Um, on CSI, they fingerprint. And one of my favorite things to do, actually, is when I'm watching, like, Dateline, Murder Mysteries, or any of these good shows, I'll see them fingerprinting with a fingerprint brush that looks like that. What's wrong with that brush? It doesn't have any fingerprint powder on it. <laughs> I've got a whole phone full of uh, images like this. So, you know, they come back and they're all nice and clean. This is the reality of what we look like. We don't get DNA in an hour. Certainly we can expedite DNA processing on some cases, but by the end of an hour-long program, uh, DNA does not come back. We don't get fingerprints back in an hour, and computers don't make fingerprint matches. So with, the, with one of the databases that we use for fingerprint identification, we can say, show me the 10 most likely matches, and it will sort through that database and provide you with the 10 most likely matches, and it will give you an arrest record of number one, or if number two is an applicant, it will give you their applicant number. But people make fingerprint identifications. Computers do not make fingerprint identifications. You can't cross-examine a computer um, if a case were to go to court. Um, I was just on a homicide investigation Tuesday a week ago, so I snapped a picture of their crime scene van. I wish we drove things like that, <laughs> but we don't. We don't use chalk. <laughs> Um, I don't know where chalk came from, but we don't outline bodies in chalk. We don't put sheets over bodies. Um, I think the sheet initially was used as a sign of respect and maybe to keep the media from looking, but that's, first of all, it's adding something to a crime scene, so it's considered tampering with a crime scene. Um, you know, a defense attorney might ask, so what else did you add to the crime scene? A gun? A fingerprint? Um, if anything, we'll set up shields or barriers or screens around a body to keep the media from looking. But of course, they've got helicopters, so then they'll fly over. But um, we don't use sheets. Medical examiners or forensic pathologists don't come out to crime scenes. There's typically a person who, um, on the West Coast, they call them MLIs, medical legal investigators. On the East Coast, we call them forensic investigators. These are people that work for the medical examiner's office, but they're not physicians. They're a, um, an intermediary between the forensic pathologists and the, <coughs> excuse me, and the crime scene people and the police. 
Um, medical examiners have better things to do with their, with their time. They've got autopsies, they've got reports to write out. Um, on a major case, it might be that they come out in, in 10 years of work for Baltimore County and two years with another county. Um, I remember the medical doctors coming out on only two scenes. Um, we don't carry weapons. Most crime labs have civilianized. They figure that they can hire people that really want to do the lab work um, and not have to give them a 20-year retirement and not have to give them day back when they go to court and call back when they go to court. Um, they can exploit us and we'll still do the job. So um, you would, when you're watching CSI, you'll see that the, the crime scene investigators are interviewing and doing search warrants and all of that, and that certainly is not the case. And then between calls, we don't have time to go back to the lab and perform these ridiculous experiments. Uh, you come in and there's a bunch of calls waiting from the previous shift and you just run call to call to call. If it's a major scene, if it's a sexual assault or a homicide or a first degree assault, um, maybe you can get somebody to cover your section of the county while you process the evidence, but typically you just run from call to call to call and in between calls you try to come back and get things into the fingerprint chamber and, and so forth, but there's really not time for that. And interestingly, so many people will ask, you know, I'll tell this great story about a crime scene, and of course the question is, well, how did it end? Oh, I don't know, I never found out. Because you're just so overwhelmed with the number of calls. So what, what is forensics then? How do we define forensics? And I'll talk about the definition in just a minute, but suffice it to say that we define forensics as the application of science to matters of the law. So in that definition, there is no mention of court there's no mention of a crime being committed. Now, the majority of forensic cases do involve a crime having been committed, but if we're defining forensics as using science under the umbrella of the legal system, then we could have a situation where, let's say a woman gives birth uh, to a child and um, is not claiming that there was anything criminal that, that had happened, but she gave birth and she wants the father to pay child support. And in the course of that, he has to have a paternity test. We're using science under the umbrella of the law. So in, the, in that particular case, we're not saying a crime was committed, but it would still constitute a forensic science. We're using science to prove paternity, and we're using that so the female can get child support. So most, crime, most forensic cases do involve crimes, but it's always a trick, true, or false question, and I give my students all forensic cases require that a crime has taken place. So some of the typical branches of forensics is crime scene investigation, people that actually go to the crime scene and collect evidence and cast footwear and tire tracks and so forth. Most crime labs have a forensic document examiner. Um, and document examiners don't just look at handwriting, they look at typewriting and Xeroxes and um, you know, computer printing and jet printing, laser printing. Firearms unit, firearms and tool mark unit is actually what we call it. Firearms examiners consider firearms a tool um, and the impressions that they leave come from burnishing and finishing processes. So we're, we're always taught to treat a firearm like a tool. Um, so of course we're looking for land and groove impressions and firing pin impressions and so forth. But firearms examiners also do serial number restorations. When someone eradicates the serial number by filing or using an acid or a chemical, they've got the means that they can also restore that serial number. Forensic toxicology, where they're looking at controlled dangerous substances. Forensic anthropology, this is a um, Catholic priest that was killed under Tito. They were executed. I took this photograph, entrance dead shot wound and an exit. And then that's me too happy in somebody's grave. Uh, forensic serology, blood spatter, whoops, blood spatter interpretation. In our lab, if you stayed for X amount of years, they would train you as an expert in something. Um, so some people had gone to blood spatter school I went to Shoe and Tire School, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I trained under Bill Bodziak, who did the Bruno Mali shoe wear investigation in the O.J. Simpson case. 
Forensic photography, anybody know what that is? A bite mark, yep, forensic odontology. What was the first case that we had forensic odontology used in court? You said you were talking about them earlier, or, some, or maybe you were. Bundy, Ted Bundy. <clears throat> Computer forensic investigations, that's my brother, I can't get away from him, I worked in the crime lab with him, he's still there. He's a computer geek. Um, fingerprint processing, latent print processing. So bad guys, if there's any bad guys out here, close your ears. But a lot of bad guys will wear gloves to a crime scene and then take them off and throw them away at the crime scene. Um, and so in addition to getting DNA from something like latex, latex gloves, if you turn it inside out and fingerprint it, I mean, they fit nice and tight. You get gorgeous, 10 gorgeous fingerprints on the inside of latex gloves. So, um, so don't tell them that. And then pattern enhancement. This is the same piece of carpet. This was just a test sample that I did. I put just a couple drops of blood in a, um, a tub of water and stepped in it and then walked and sprayed it with luminol. Luminol is used to find cleaned up blood. I don't know what picture was supposed to be there, but it didn't come up. But pattern enhancements and, um, and injury documentation, so these are stab wounds, there it is. Um, and then shoe and tire examinations, so um, this guy Gary is, is wearing the shoe of a suspect and is taking a known footwear impression. Why do we wear the shoe? Because we want the same pressure that someone would have as they step in it, so to just take it and push it on a piece of paper uh, would not be sufficient. He, the bottom of that is coated with ink, by the way. And the same would be with a tire. If we had a tire track from a crime scene and we wanted to take a known tire impression, we would drive the vehicle over an ink pad and then drive it onto paper. We wouldn't just roll the tire because we want those pressures to be the same. Forensic entomology, we can get time of death from looking at insect activity. Um, when you're watching CSI and the forensic investigator, or medical examiner says, oh, they died at 2 a.m., 2, 2 11 a.m., that's unrealistic. Um, all of our time since death estimates are within a pretty broad range. Um, the way that we can narrow it down the best is if we have um, entomological evidence, if we have gastric contents, if we know the last time they ate, and we can see how far that bolus of food has moved in their GI system. And then if we look at the vitreous humor, which is the, the, um, the, the filling of the eyeball, if you will, it's a, like a gel-like filling. Um, we look at potassium levels because we know that potassium levels change at a constant rate. So those are the most accurate. The other thing that's really useful is if we, if we have a decomposed body and we just don't know when they died, Look at the silly stuff. When did the milk expire? How long has the newspaper been piling up on the front porch? Listen to the voicemails. How long have they been getting voicemails? Um, so forensics define the application of science to matters of the law. So I just want to talk about this slide for a second. So any of these disciplines, if I were to put a big X through the forensic word, any of these disciplines exist without forensic attached to it. So I'll use the example of my brother-in-law, who's an entomologist. And he works for USDA, and he studies fungi that will kill bugs that eat corn, but if people eat the corn, you won't get sick. So he like produces fungi, or I don't know what he does. Um, but he's an entomologist, and he works with corn and bugs. But if we were to call him and say, hey, John, we have a decomposed body. We need you to come out to this crime scene. We're pulling him out from over here under the umbrella of the legal system, and he gets the F word attached. He's now a forensic entomologist. And then when he's done, he goes back to USDA, and the F word goes away. Or a geologist who studies rocks and soil, and we want him or her to compare soil from a suspect shoe with that at the crime scene. They come under the umbrella. They get the F word. They're operating as a forensic geologist. When they're done, they go out, and they lose the word forensic. Um, what's another one? An engineer, forensic engineer. When 9-11 happened, and you know, even in September, you'll see on Discovery Channel and whatnot, all the people talking about how the jet fuel heated the girders of the Twin Towers, and they reconstruct how they fell. Those are engineers 
that are operating under the umbrella of the legal system, criminal justice system, and they're operating as forensic engineers. Statistics, I always stump my students with this one. We use statistics a lot in forensics. Now I know in criminal justice, they look at crime stats and do all of their calculations, but in forensics, we use statistics for, anybody know? What do we use stats for? The probability that, we use statistics in DNA. So with fingerprints, we say it is Dana Coleman's fingerprint or it is not Dana Coleman's fingerprint. It is Bill Garvin's fingerprint or it isn't. With, with DNA, we say the probability that the DNA belongs to someone other than my client or you know the, the, plaintiff, the suspect in the case is one in 200,000, whatever. Um, so anyway, the takeaway message here is that all of, these, all of these disciplines exist without forensic attached to them. Um, now, in a police department or in a crime lab, all they work on are things that are under the umbrella. So they truly are only forensic statisticians or only forensic photographers. But there isn't a discipline out there, I don't know, maybe astrophysics, that I can't think would have some sort of forensic application. A forensic, a forensic astrophysicist, I don't know what they would do. I don't know, a crime scene on Mars or something. What's that? The death of stars, there we go. <laughs> the murder of stars. So when we think about these different fields, I kind of like to put them in a concentric ring of, of um, how people might perceive them to be in terms of their scientificness. Now for any of these to be used in court, they meet certain requirements. They meet requirements of Daubert and Fry for the admissibility of scientific evidence. But there are some things that we don't really give much thought to, like fingerprints or DNA or toxicology. We know the science is good. We might question the practitioner. Um, there was a case in Maryland, for the sake of time, I don't want to go into it, but um, one of our judges actually threw out fingerprint evidence on a murder case and said, show me the science. Show me the data that says no two people have the same fingerprints. And it caused a big hubbub for a while and ultimately uh, that was resolved. But then when we go out to this ring, where it's not a hard science, it's not a test tube science, hairs and fiber analysis, firearms analysis, question document, shoe and tire. Some have argued that that's not as scientific as this. And so in the forensic community, it has caused people to go back and look at the standards and come up with different means of validating their science and proving in court that they're adhering to scientific methods and methodology. Um, what we use is something called ACE-V, analysis, comparison, evaluation, and verification. But then we get out on this ring here, and this is kind of like the, oh, I don't know, can this come in? Nose prints, ear prints, elbow prints, lip prints. Is this scientific, is this real science, or is this junk science? And then out here in this realm, you know, we could put some of the other things like psychics that probably wouldn't be allowed into court. So let's just talk about some of these things for a minute. Retinal eye patterns, retinal eye patterns have been proven to be unique to the individual. Lip prints, the science is called chilioscopy. And there are individuals that claim that the shape of your lips is unique to you. So if you were to leave a lip print on a wine glass or you know, a, a window, that they can match that lip back to you. And so the way that I kind of frame it in my mind is would I want to send someone to jail without hard science to prove that these are unique for the rest of their life based on a lip print? And my feeling is if you have a lip print, you've got DNA, so let's just go with the DNA and forget the lips. Ear prints, um, there are some that claim that ear prints are unique to the individual. Um, I'll tell a couple quick stories about ear prints. The first one is a good friend of mine is a forensic artist, and she's nationally recognized. She does stuff for National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. And um, if there is a child who was abducted as a, as a young kid and then is found a couple years later or many years later, and there have been some cases like that in the news. 
while they're waiting for DNA to come back or fingerprints to come back, if there even were fingerprints of them as a child, um, one of the things that she can look at are ears. She can identify on the basis of an ear, but if there's a picture of that child's ear and then as an adult she gets an ear picture, um, she can make an exclusion on ears. So there's something about ears. Um, and then the other story is that I have four kids, two are adopted from Mexico and two are from Guatemala. And when we went to Guatemala to get my two sons, um, we had to stop at the embassy for them to have their ears photographed. I thought, what is this about? And before they let us take them out of the country, they matched the pictures of their ears that were taken at birth with the picture of their ear before we took them out of the country. And they didn't do DNA, they didn't look at fingerprints, they are in the United States because their ears matched. Um, so there's, I don't know, there's something about ears. Elbow prints, I'm not even gonna talk about that. Polygraph analysis and voice stress analysis, we can use these as part of an investigation, but the courts don't deem them to be repeatable and reliable. And they're not reliable because they're not repeatable. Um, and so we can use them, but we can uh, have them admitted into court. For those of you, I think everybody knows what a polygraph is. For those of you that don't know what voice stress analysis is, um, a very exaggerated version of it would be, um, I go in and they say, what is your name? Dana Coleman, where do you live? 1602 Beachwood Avenue. Who are you married to? Robert Wall. Um, did you kill your mother? No. So, so they're looking at variations, just like a polygraph, variations from the norm in your responses. But again, is it repeatable? What if you have a cold? What if you're tired? What if you were out the night before at a concert and you were yelling and your voice is hoarse? So um, anyway, they're not used in court. I'm not gonna talk about palm reflection creases, but fingernail striations have been proven to be unique to the individual. The striations in your fingernails are created by the same cells, the, they're called dermal papillae, same structures that create the friction ridges in your fingerprints, and so these have been proven to be unique to you. Cow nose prints and dog nose prints and cat nose prints, I've never handled a crime scene involving nose prints of an animal, but you know the beaded pattern, that little speckled pattern and the, the creases and so forth are also unique to an animal, no different than stripes on a zebra. So let's just talk about some of the cool things that we can do in forensics that is all about thinking outside the box. And I have a little bit of a, a cheat sheet here just so I don't forget all the, the details of these cases. So the first one is plant DNA. And this came about um, in a case that happened in the early 90s. It was two individuals, Mark Bogan was the, um, the suspect in the case and ultimately convicted, and the victim was a woman named Denise Johnson. Um, early one morning, a motorcyclist was riding in Arizona through this field here and came across the body of Denise Johnson. And she had been asphyxiated, she had been tied, there was barbed wire that was associated with her body. Um, as the police were investigating, they heard a beep, 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 and they're looking in the grass and they find a pager. And the pager comes back to an individual named Earl Bogan. Um, and this happens to be the father of the suspect. When they wind up going and talking to the father, they ultimately find their way to the son. And the son says, well, um, I think initially he denied any, having any knowledge, but there was a witness who saw his truck in the area leaving this field. And so he changed his story and he said, oh, I was with her and um, I was her customer, if you will, for the evening, but um, we got in an argument and I dropped her off. And when I, when I dropped her off, she, she stole my father's pager. So whoever killed her took her there and she must have left the pager there, right? Um, as the police are investigating the scene, they notice that this tree has recent damage to it, like somebody bumped into it with a vehicle. Um, and when they're interviewing Mark Bogan and they're looking in his truck, there are two seed pods from a Palo Verde tree. So the question became, could his truck 
have bumped this tree, and in doing so, the seed pods fell into the bed of his truck. And so the investigators contacted um, an individual by the name of Dr. Tim Hillenjaris, who is a, um, a plant geneticist at University of Arizona. And so what he did is he took some samples of seed pods from the tree and mashed them against seed pods that were recovered from the truck, and it was a DNA match. So then the question became, well, do all Palo Verde trees, because of the way they pollinate, do they have the same DNA, or are there differences? So he went out in this field and he tested 10 more Palo Verde trees, and they all had different genetic signatures. And then he went and he tested another, I believe it was another 19, or it was a total of 19, I can't remember off the top of my head, and was able to show that no two Palo Verde trees, because of the way that they pollinate, have the same genetic signature. And this was the first time that plant DNA was used in court. Um, ultimately, he was convicted, and, um, and I believe, I thought I had it written down here, I believe he had a, um, he got a life sentence. Um, we, there have been some other cases, one of which that I worked, that um, involved plant matter that was left behind. It's an open case, I can't talk too much about it, but in this particular case, we reached out to Dr. Hill and Jars and said, this is what we've got. Unfortunately, the plant that we had wasn't wild, it had been raised in a nursery, and so God only knows how many of those plants have the same parent material, so it didn't turn out to be useful in, in our case. Diatoms, this is really cool. I first heard about this case on, I think it was Forensic Files. Um, the episode is called Real Danger, R-E-E-L, Danger. Um, and in this particular case, we have two, um, two boys that were fishing. This is in Connecticut. And there was a group of three boys that were up to no good. Um, and they had been knocking on doors, and they had roused the suspicion of um, individuals in the neighborhood, and they noticed, the individuals in the neighborhood noticed that these boys were carrying a bat. Ultimately, they make their way down to this pond where these two young boys are fishing, and they beat the boys with a baseball bat, and they leave them face down in the water, leave them, um, they presume they were dead. The one boy was unconscious, the other boy was pretending to be unconscious. He woke up, he carried his friend over a mile to the nearest house, and, um, and the good news is ultimately they both survived. But in the meantime, as they're doing, police are doing their investigation, one of the witnesses described one of the boys, described a, a keloid that he had on his, on his forearm, and ultimately they found, police found their way to these three boys. And of course they deny having been at this, um, at this pond. Well, as they're executing a search warrant at one, at one of the houses, they find a pair of tennis shoes that were wet and that were encrusted in mud. And so they wanted, initially they wanted to find maybe a geologist that could show that the mud on the shoe was the same as the mud from the pond, but they found themselves with someone even better. And this was a forensic, what is it, a liminologist? Um, and these are individuals that study single-celled organisms like algae. And in this particular case, we have diatoms, which is the, the silica residue that is left behind by, um, by this particular type of, of algae. And we use diatoms all the time. I remember when I was in graduate school, I learned that fire safes are, are packed with diatoms, and so if you have someone that's broken into a safe, to check like the cuffs of their pants because ultimately you might be able to match that back to the, to the particular safe because the diatoms come in so many different shapes and sizes. Um, so just to give you an example, um, we use diatoms for filtering. Hot tubs have uh, filters that are lined with diatoms. It's an abrasive and toothpaste and metal polishes. It's an absorbent for liquids and chemicals. It's a reinforcing filter in plastics and rubbers. It's in cat litter. Um, it's an activator in, um, in blood clotting studies. So at any rate, this, um, this researcher who happened to be at University of Connecticut, he was a diatom specialist, and he was able to match some of the diatoms that were on the shoes 
um, or not just some of them, he was able to match the colony of diatoms that were on the shoes with the same colony of diatoms that were in that particular freshwater pond. Um, in, particular, in particular, there were sealed chrysophytes and three species of eunotia, which were very specific to that particular pond. Um, and so, you know, so there are some cases that I handled where, in hindsight, I just want to go back, open cases where there was a water environment, and, you know, every day you learn something new, like, oh my gosh, go back and check the shoes for, for um, any sort of diatom or diatomaceous residues. This is one of my favorite cases, pacemaker case. This happened in Tasmania. Um, so we have an elderly individual by the name of David Crawford, and, um, and then we have a young guy, younger guy, who was kind of a, um, you know, he roamed the neighborhood and caused all kinds of trouble, and his name was Ivan Jones. And so one particular night, uh, David Crawford is, um, well, we find out later he is awakened by a burglary of his home, and ultimately he is killed. The person who finds him is Ivan Jones. When the sun comes up, Ivan Jones calls the police and says, hey, neighbor down the street is dead. He's in the driveway. When the police investigate, they find that David Crawford has sustained six ax wounds to the head and to the face. Um, and so in talking to individuals and some of the other evidence had led them back to Ivan Jones. Ivan Jones said he was sleeping in his sister's trailer. And the sister said, um, yeah, he, I went to bed at midnight and he was there. Um, and I woke up at four o'clock and I saw him there. And then I, I had gone out to get, I believe she went out to get cigarettes. When I came back at six o'clock, he was in the shower. So he had a tentative alibi. When David Crawford went to the medical examiner's office, they discovered that he had a pacemaker. Pacemaker data overwrites every 48 hours. So the medical examiner wanted to get the data off of that pacemaker before it overwrote itself. And in the nick of time, he got that data off of the pacemaker. And as it turns out, you could see that David Crawford was asleep. He was in, you know, I don't pretend to understand heart rhythms, but he was in a certain rhythm. And then he wakes up. You could see where he woke up, probably hearing the burglary of his house. You could see, based upon the heart rhythm, when he was in an altercation. And then you could tell the exact moment he took his last breath. And as it turned out, it was in that small window that the sister could not verify that he was in, that, uh, in, the, in the trailer. So in this particular case, the pacemaker data pinpointed the time of death better than you know, a medical examiner could do on their own. And so it, it undermined this alibi. Um, trash bags and, and rubber band and um, other things that cause striations um, have been shown to maybe not so much be unique to a particular item, but we can narrow down class characteristics. So in 1995, there was a body of a, a nine-year-old girl, Jessica Knott, um, and she was found by a water treatment plant, and her body was covered in a 30-gallon plastic bag. Um, there was no footwear evidence, there was no DNA evidence, there was no blood evidence. Um, they had some fibers, they had some animal hairs, and they had the plastic bag. <clears throat> so in this particular case, the, um, the criminalist had um, narrowed down to the best of their ability who makes 30-gallon plastic bags um, and ultimately went to the factory where those plastic bags were made and took samples of bags that were in varying stages of the, of the production process. So it starts out as, um, as a hard plastic, and then it's melted, and then it's, it's put through rollers, and then ultimately cooled using, um, using cold water. So they had a number of samples, and ultimately they were able to show that the class characteristics in the bag that was, um, that was used to cover the girl's body was similar to a, um, a family acquaintance 
when they did a search warrant of his house, he had a, um, a box of 30-gallon bags underneath of his sink. And so as part of this study, they also wanted to find out how long those class characteristics will retain those, um, I don't want to call them unique, but will retain those striations before they change just based upon general use. Um, ultimately, in this case, they were able to present in court that the plastic bags were, um, were consistent with the bags that were um, recovered from let me rephrase that. They were able to show that the plastic bags recovered during the search warrant were consistent with the plastic bag that was used to cover her body. Um, there was another case, and I learned about it many years ago, and I can't remember the details, but it was also, um, it was a homicide, and the person was rubber banded with those big, thick rubber bands. And they were able, based upon the striations in those rubber bands, were able to match them back up to a particular box of rubber bands that was found in a suspect's car. Zip ties come together, in, come in my mind too. There was a case where striations on zip ties that were used to bind a victim um, matched zip ties in a box that were found in a suspect's car. So striations is a, is a you know, we might not often think about that. The person who would match up these striations is the firearms examiner. Firearms examiner is the one that matches striations from firing, question and known, firing pin impressions or breech block impressions or land and groove impressions. Um, so they would match up these striations just as they would fingernail striations. Oops. Oh. Bomb pulse dating. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I first heard about bomb pulse dating maybe, I don't know, four years ago at a forensic conference. They had someone from NECMEC, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children talking. Um, and they were saying how they were using bomb pulse dating to determine how long um, a particular individual has been deceased. And so when we think of, well, ultimately this is carbon dating, but when we think about archeological use of carbon dating, we're talking about the breakdown of carbon, the half-life of carbon. But in the case of bomb pulse dating, we're looking at the absorption of atmospheric carbon that came from all of the bombs that were put off in the 1950s and 1960s, and it ended with the limited test ban um, to which the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Soviet Union all agreed to. But nonetheless, there's still a certain level of atmospheric carbon, so we're not looking like archeology, span we're not looking at the half-life, we're looking at the absorption. And we know that that absorption decreases by 4% each year, and we know that by 2030, unless we start testing again, it will probably be depleted. So by looking at the amount of carbon that a particular individual has absorbed, we can tell how long they have been dead. This is for modern people. This isn't for archeological people. And this is really important because if we come across a body and we don't know, has it been here 10 years? Has it been here 30 years? Um, to have that and to pinpoint it within just a, a year or two, give or take with a standard degree of error, that's fantastic information. Unfortunately, we're gonna lose that in, um, in not that long, in 10 more years. Forensic palynology is, um, is the study of pollen, and a couple cases come to mind again. This is something that is big with NECMEC, National Center, again, for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, there was a case in Boston. It was called the, um, it was called the Boston uh, Baby Doe case. And it was a two-year-old girl that was found in a lake. And um, they didn't know who she was. She, was um, she had been there for a while, so doing any sort of visual identification was not going to happen but they were able to look at the pollen, and they found that the pollen that was associated with her body came from cedar trees that were not wild cedar trees. These were cedar trees that would have um, likely been in the Boston Arboretum. And so by narrowing their search based upon pollen, they were able to find um, her family. I, for, I don't know the details of the entire case. I don't know if the family was involved or the family didn't report her missing. Um, but we can also use pollen um, if we have drugs that have been smuggled into the United States, we can look at pollen and determine what part of the world these drugs have come from. Uh, there have been some cases that I've worked on 
where we have taken swabs of the grill of a car to get pollen to determine if a suspect was in particular areas. So pollen reminds me a lot of diatoms. Different areas of our environment have very unique signatures of pollen, just like they, just like um, freshwater wetlands have unique signatures of diatoms. So I, I think we're gonna hear more about pollen analysis in the upcoming years. <clears throat> Cat hair, and by extension, uh, we could use dog hair. There was a case in, um, in Canada, Prince Edward Island, where a woman by the name of Shirley Duguay was killed by her husband, Doug Beamish. At least at the time, he was a prime suspect in the case. Um, near her battered body was a black leather jacket. So first thing, if you're gonna kill somebody, don't leave your jacket behind. Um, but there was a black leather jacket, and on the inside of that jacket were 27 white cat hairs. When they investigated Doug Beamish, they found that he lived with his parents. His parents had a white cat named Snowball. Um, and so the question then became, well, can we match through DNA, can we match the hair back to the cat? Which sounds, okay, yeah, why not? We can use DNA if it has root material, just with, with humans, we can match it back. The issue was, this is Prince Edward Island. It's an island. So if the cats are interbreeding, are they going to have, how many cats are gonna have the same genetic signature? So they wanted to prove it was Snowball, but now there's some questions about that. So they sent Snowball's blood and the cat hairs to, I think it's called the Feline Center for Genomic Diversity, and of all places, Frederick, Maryland. Who would have guessed? And, um, and ultimately, they were able to prove that despite it being an island and despite it, um, you know, cats don't, you, it's like the Roach Motel, you can come in, but you never check out. Um, they were able to prove that the cats all had different genetic signatures, and so this factored heavily in the conviction of him. The MVAC, the MVAC is sort of, I think it's a neat little secret that you're gonna hear more about. Um, <clears throat> so the MVAC has come out of Utah, a researcher there who I don't believe is even a forensic person, I think they're a chemist or maybe a biologist. They've come up with a system where you can wet vacuum evidence to recover skin cells on things that you otherwise would not be able to get DNA from. And so we've had two cold cases in recent years that have been closed because of the use of the MVAC. Um, and the one that I'll talk about, a, a woman by then, a, a girl I should say, 17 years old, Kristen Lynn Bislanovich. Um, she had been killed um, and her body was left on the Provo River in Utah. And, um, and next to her body, there was a rock that had blood on it. Um, or there was a rock that they believed had had blood on it, but the, the evidence had been compromised. It had been outside, and they were unable to obtain a genetic profile from that. And so fast forward like 20 years, using the MVAC, which essentially puts into solution, it's almost like a wet vacuum, it puts into solution the DNA. You, you wet it and you suck it up, and then it's filtered, and then what is captured in that filter is tested they were able to get suspect DNA from that particular rock. Um, so there have been a couple cases that I know the MVAC is being used. I think that this is just gonna blow cases wide open. So, so in, the, in the case of a rock, for example, it's porous, it's dirty, it will compromise DNA. It's not like the floor where you know it's a shiny floor and you just get a swab and you swab it up. It just gets down in those nooks and crannies and it can be hard to get it out. And then in this case, the, the rocks had been outside, they had been weathered, they had been compromised, they had been in the evidence room for God, you know, 20 years, God knows how long they've been in there. So I think this wet back, we're gonna hear a lot more about this. I think this is really exciting. Um, number two, um, look from above. So this image here is a satellite image in um, West Mesa, um, is it New Mexico? West Mesa, I think it's New Mexico. Um, anyway, there had been the bodies of um, a number of prostitutes that had gone missing, uh, the bodies hadn't, the prostitutes had gone missing. 
And um, nobody knew what had happened to them. And they had investigators out on the street. And, um, and there was some talk of a particular individual who drove a particular vehicle, but there just wasn't a whole lot of information that was forthcoming. This particular area was going to be under development. And so you've got a little, um, a little arroyo that's going down here. Um, and a woman was walking her dog here, and she had the dog off leash, and the dog came back and it had human bones. And so this started a police investigation. Police go out and start looking. Now this picture was taken pre-development, so they're gonna build condos or something here. So this was part of the permitting process. They took some aerial photographs. And so, you know, you, you look and don't see a whole lot, but then after the bones were found, they go back and they take another aerial photograph. Um, and actually, this may have been also part of that permitting process. I can't remember. Nonetheless, what do you, do you see anything different between this and this? Tire tracks. You see tire tracks where he's going back and forth, and you've got all these bald spots. These are all the graves. So whoever it is, is going back and forth. See, that, that's all, you know, you don't have those areas. Now, I don't know what year this one, is that over there? Is that, well, these are screenshots. So, um, but you have these tire tracks. So I told you I was a shoe and tire examiner. The, these tire tracks you would not be able to see from the ground. You can only see these from an aerial view. As a shoe and tire examiner, I know that you can take some measurements on these and get wheelbase and track width, which is gonna narrow down the suspect pool of vehicles. Um, so at any rate, really, really interesting stuff. So also in terms of looking from above, just some of the things that I'm interested in. Uh, this is my daughter, and I made her pretend she was dead. And, um, and I've got, I, I have a, a drone, I have a couple drones, but I had put evidence out there. But at any rate, from up here, now look where I'm standing, which you shouldn't stand in your own image, but I did. Um, but I drive a Jeep, you can see, my Jeep is right over here, you can see my own, my own tire tracks, which on the ground, I couldn't even see them. I didn't even know that they were there. But again, looking from above, so this, this was an interesting day, I'll tell you the story in a minute. So I told Sophie, all right, we're gonna, we're gonna go play an adult version of hide and seek. So um, I had her lay down, and then um, I have a FLIR, forward-looking infrared radar, that I mount on my drone. So I said, okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get in a suitcase and take it in the middle of the field, get in the suitcase, zip yourself up, and I'm gonna find you. And so she gets in the suitcase and I find her. And so then I tell her, okay, so now I'm gonna get, put you in a trash bag. And I want you to go out and tie yourself up in the trash bag and I'm gonna find you. And so she puts herself in the trash bag and I find her. Okay, now put yourself in a white one. She puts herself in the white one and I find her. Hide yourself under a blanket. I had her in trash cans, I had her in suitcases, I had her in trash cans, I had all kinds of stuff. But then we moved over to the woods, and I had her doing it in the woods, and um, <laughs> a family came through and said, oh my God, there's some, I think there was somebody in a trash bag out there. I was like, oh, it's just my daughter. But, um, but, but anyway, so in terms of looking from, from above, why, why is this important? Like, what, what does this have to do with anything? Well. This is something that I'm really interested in. So as, as Bill had mentioned, I do a lot of cold case work with, um, with regional agencies. And, um, and so if you have something that is decomposing in the woods, it is producing heat. And so I wanna find heat signatures looking, for my, looking with my FLIR. Now, of course, if I just had her laying out there, you'd see her laying out there. But the, um, I'm sorry, I'm not good at this. But the FLIR camera, it doesn't, it's not like it has x-ray vision and it's looking through the suitcase, it's looking at transferred heat. And so it's looking at her body heat being transferred to the suitcase or to the plastic bag. And I got this, I got this idea when I was watching the um, Boston Marathon bombing 
and they were, they were using the overhead FBI um, aircraft um, FLIR. And you could see, was it Sarnayev? I can't remember which one was which, but you could see him underneath of that winterizing plastic on the boat. And so I thought, you know, why, if we can see him, why can't we see, why couldn't we see dead people? And so I've been doing a lot with roadkill, bearing roadkill, and then flying it over and see if you can see the heat coming up through the ground from roadkill, which you can. Um, I'm not so sure we're seeing heat or maybe just differentially trapped water. Regardless, we see something that would make you want to go dig there. So um, anyway, so this was just kind of looking from above. And then last but not least, I'm sorry, I didn't know there'd be little people here. That doesn't say what you think it is. It, I just left the E off of it. Um, so so um, this is a case involving dog dew on a shoe. Um, and it's one of my favorite cases to talk about. So in this particular case, we, and again, this is thinking outside the box. So we had a guy that was working in this apartment right here. He's a maintenance guy. And he had an ongoing beef with another guy. And so he comes walking out, and he's going to get in his car to leave. And, um, and according to witnesses, somebody came running through the bushes, shoots him, and then runs back. And this is in the winter. It's cold outside. Um, there's no, really no blood that's left behind because he has on a big poofy coat. After he was shot, the medics came. They transported him to the hospital where he was ultimately pronounced dead. But his coat had absorbed most of the, or if not all of the blood. So there's really no blood there. Um, there were no cartridge casings because the guy was shooting a revolver. So there's no expended um, ammunition. Um, you know, what do we do? He didn't, there's really nothing that he touched. He ran and ran back. And so just in case witnesses are wrong, we'll still process the vehicles, maybe tow his vehicle back. But there's really nothing, there's not a whole lot to do. You know, what do you do? Process the air? Capture his scent? You know, what would they do on CSI? So in the meantime, all of the news stations have come and they're all setting up, and this is a relatively nice neighborhood, and it's not, you know, crimes like this don't occur. And so I'm with my, my friend, and, you know, we're walking back and forth. We're just trying to find anything. And so I tell her, I'm like, hey, April, like, just look good for the news. Just, like, point your flashlight. Like, even though there's nothing there, just point, and we'll look good on the news. And so we're bending over, and we're pointing. And um, as we're bending down, we're whispering to each other, like, I smell pills. Like, is that you? In the meantime, we had stepped in dog crap, and we had it on our shoes. The homicide detectives, in the meantime, are conducting interviews, and they know that this guy that has died had a beef with, the su with a particular suspect. And so they get in touch with him. He said that he had been in Washington, D.C. that day, but there's a cell phone tower right there, and his cell phone was pinging off of that tower at about the time of the homicide. So they get him, and they bring him into the precinct. So we get on the radio, and we have the officers at the precinct check the outsoles of his shoes for canine fecal material. And the officers come back and say, oh, there's a big 10-4 on that. So we're like, yes. So we go to the precinct, and we collect his shoes. But that also means that at the crime scene, we got to collect all the dog crap. And when, if you've watched any CSI, you take a lot of pictures. Overall, mid-range mid close-up with and without a scale. And there was a lot of dog poop here. So we're just like photographing the heck out of it. And then you've got to triangulate it all in. We wound up calling the traffic unit that has total station to satellite map all this poop. Um, so we collect the poop. We collect his shoes. But now we don't know what to do with it. Like, where is it in your SOP manual? When a bad guy steps in poop, this is what you do. So, um, so we start doing an internet search, and we find an individual um, who's a researcher in California, and he traces mountain lions through their scat. And so we get in touch with him, and, um, and we tell him, all right, well, we don't have a cat, but we got a bunch of dog poop and a pair of shoes. 
um, can you help us out here? And so he tells us he can, but he also needs known DNA samples from the dogs that live in the apartment complex. So in the previous image, I showed you the guy, Gary, who was doing the shoe, or had the suspect shoe on. His dad is a veterinarian. So we call his dad and we say, hey, Dr. Hauptman, how would you like to get the F word attached today and become a forensic veterinarian? And so sure enough, he goes out with the detectives and we get search warrants for the dogs and we get all of the dog's DNA. We get buckle swabs from all of the dogs. So all of that FedEx overnight. Um, and so ultimately what we get back is like a, a map that this poop man had created and he shows like Fido and apartment 306 and all Fido, Fido likes to poop over there and Shadow likes to poop over there, all Shadow's poop. When he's tracing mountain lions though, he's looking not at DNA because fecal material, the bacterial content will degrade DNA. Um, but he's looking at enzymes. So, you know, I like to think of it, there's four different blood groups, right? A, B, O, and A, B, and that's what we used to use back in the day. And people say, oh, that's terrible because so, so many people have whatever, type O. Um, and that's true. I mean, you can exclude. It's like any class characteristic evidence. You can exclude, but you can't identify. But then when you start adding different factors and enzymes to it, even though they're type O, but now they're, t now they're O positive, and they've got this and that and all the you know, biological markers that are above and beyond me, um, we can still narrow that population even smaller and smaller. So that's pretty much what he was doing with with the Mount Lion scat. So he was able to identify something like 12 out of 14 enzymes that for him were great. Like, wow, this is better than what I get from my cats. And so this was exciting news for us, but then, you know, go back to the very beginning where I've got my concentric circle of scientificness. Is this ever gonna come into court? We got a poop man, right? And he's a cat expert, but we're looking at dogs and I don't know how many blood types cats have. I know dogs, I think, have seven. And is it, you know, what, what kind of, what does your lab look like? Do you keep lab notes? So all of these questions start to come up. Ultimately, um, investigators presented this information to him in such a way that they elicited a confession. But I like to talk about this case because I think just like all of the previous nine, it literally, it exemplifies in my mind thinking outside the box. So, you know, you go to, you read a forensic book and a textbook and if this, then that, but once you're in the real world, you see that no two crime scenes are the same. And, you know, what do you do? I, I got a print hit off of an eggshell. It was of all nights Halloween night. Um, a kid threw eggs at a car and the person reached out with a gun and shot and killed him. And, um, and so I was fingerprinting eggshells. Like, where is that in the SOPs, how to fingerprint an eggshell? Um, but again, it just it illustrates this whole thing, thinking outside the box. So I'm going to have you guys think outside the box here. This is the last slide, <coughs> running over just a little bit. But um, we have, obviously, two deceased individuals. And the question that I have for you is did they die at or about the same time, or is there a period of time that elapsed between their deaths? And so I'll just give you a minute, I'll just give everybody just a second to kind of take it in. I can explain a little bit. So this is a female, um, she's got a plate of chicken or something, I don't know what it is. Um, she has sustained a gunshot wound to the head. The um, contrast isn't very good, but her, her shirt is all blood soaked um, and her head is to the side. She's got long hair. She's just slumped over. Um, two packs of cigarettes, beer, a phone, a spoon, a soda cup or whatever. Um, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. We've got him. He has sustained a gunshot wound to the chest. <clears throat> They're in their living room. This is a sliding glass door that has the curtain drawn. It's summer, obviously, because of the clothing. So, so what are your thoughts? Did they die at or about the same time? 
or was there a period of time that elapsed? Go ahead. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. He he is not having an open casket. He he is putrefying. There's skin slippage. You can see big blisters. Um, I don't want to go too much into the science of what all this is, but it's called liver mortis, and maybe some of you know. But the blood from the liver mortis is all putrefying. He's starting to bloat. His face is is you know discolored. He's starting to purge. And so we don't see that on her. So that would be an indication that he died first. Anybody else have any thoughts or is anything that you see in here? Go ahead. You think that they put her there? Because that's a very unnatural position. I, okay, and I, I acknowledge that. Anybody see anything else? Yeah, there's a gun right there. So now, how does that change it up? And so let me also, let me also say this whole common sense thing. Um, apparently this came from a movie that I never knew. I thought that my colleagues made it up. But we call it the hinky factor. I don't know what I don't know what movie it's from, but um, but we always say like that's hinky, like something's hinky. It's and the hinky is just like I don't know, petting a cat the wrong way, and your hair goes up. So you know, on crime scenes, we'll walk through, and and if there's something hinky, we don't let it go until we can explain it. So if he died first, then how is the gun under his arm unless he kills himself and languishes well it doesn't make sense here's the other hinky thing if you walk in and your boyfriend or husband whatever I think is a boyfriend if if he's all rotten and dead are you gonna be like hey dude sorry I'm gonna eat my chicken I'm gonna sit right here and eat my chicken like who eats their chicken next to your next to him that's not that's not okay so that's hinky. So I hear you're, you're absolutely right. Like he's showing signs that he died first. And you're right. You're shot in the head. Where's the blood? And how is the chicken still there? Anything else? Anything else might be able to explain this? or Go ahead. Okay, so so where are you going to go with that about body temperature and alcohol? To make it look like okay, so so he's drinking his beer and then they kill him and abduct her and take her out and then, I don't know, some or maybe take her to another room, whatever, and then bring her back at a later point. Yeah, okay. Now, um, when we talk about rigor mortis, rigor, the stiffening, it comes for 12 hours, it stays for 12, and then it goes away after 12. So if we look at her, she, she looks like she's in rigor to me. Um, I can't, I can't tell for sure, but her legs certainly look pretty stiff there. So that means that we're tw at least 24, no more than 24 hours. So now we're right back to where we were. Okay, so if she is still in rigor, then she's only been dead 24 hours. That's a big difference between that and that. We actually, for a period of time, used this as an interview question for new technicians, just to get them thinking, looking at the bigger picture here. 
Where I thought you were going with the alcohol is that alcohol can raise body temperature and drugs can too, and that can affect decomposition, um, at least to a certain extent. What, um, I've already told you the answer, but I just want to hear it again. What season is this? It's summer. And this is one of probably 150 crime scene photos of this particular room. But this is the sliding glass door. So if you just imagine the sliding glass door extends all the way over here. And, and imagine that the position of the curtains is what it is, the entire length of the door. That would mean that the curtains are, are closed. The curtains are drawn across the door. And so it's summertime. Does that mean that the sliding glass door is open to allow the breeze in, or do you think the sliding glass door is closed? Closed, it's closed because what is on? And the vent is right over top of her. So we have a homicide, suicide. How the chicken didn't fall is the million dollar question because we've all gone round and round about that. But um, I guess he was mad because she didn't bring him chicken, I don't know. But um, he shoots and kills her, shoots himself. And we have this, you know, two people that are just uh, arms like apart from each other. This differential decomposition or preservation, however you want to look at it, just because of an air conditioning vent. So anyway, the moral of the story is think outside the box. So in thinking outside the box, does anybody have any questions? Yes? And I know, ex <clears throat> so that is a fantastic question. Fantastic. So you have, I don't know what you have, but let's just say you have on a Nike Air Jordan. Let's just say. And let's just say you wear a size 5 Nike Air Jordan. You're absolutely right. How many size 5 Nike Air Jordans are there? There are a lot of them out there. So how do we match that shoe back to you? So the first thing that we're going to look at is something that we call design characteristics. So I think the one that ev will register with everyone is a Converse All-Star. We all know what the bottom of a Converse All-Star looks like. And Timberland is very unique. But we have stores like Walmart and whatnot that have knockoffs on those. And because of copyright, they can't replicate that sole, so they're a little different. But I'm going to come back to that. So we're going to look at design characteristics. With design characteristics, let's just say you have a zigzag on your shoe, and it starts going up, and then it goes down, and up and down. So it starts going up. And even though everybody in this room has a size 5 Nike Air Jordan, and I've got a crime scene impression, my pattern starts with a down zig, not an up zig. So now I can exclude everyone whose pattern starts with an up zigzag versus a down zigzag. Then we're going to look at size. And when we say size, I don't so much mean shoe size. You can't really accurately tell shoe size from an impression just because I got on cowboy boots and my toe ends here. The whole tip of this shoe is not filled with my foot but it's going to leave a great big impression, right? So when we say size, we're going to measure the zigs and the zags and the circles on the Converse All-Star. And then we're going to look at wear. How do you wear your shoes? So I broke this ankle really, really bad, and I, hurt, and I have a bad knee on this leg. And so I kind of walk a little funny, and I wear my shoes really funny on this side. So we're going to look at wear. <clears throat> But here's the most important thing. If we have a similarity between design and size and wear, we're going to go to our last category, and that is what we call accidental characteristics. And that is a wad of gum that's stuck in your shoe, or a nail, or a cut, or a chunk that came out because you stepped on a piece of broken glass. Ultimately, we make identifications based upon 
individual characteristics. If we have a correspondence in design and style and size, but we don't have an individual characteristic, we say in court, I cannot identify, but I cannot eliminate. I cannot identify, but I cannot eliminate. <clears throat> so that was a fantastic question. Anybody else? Go ahead. I do. Um, well, I well, I think initially um, the speed with which investigations take place. Um, I think that television shows have conditioned them to think that DNA happens like this, and. And, um, and, the, and the notion that every case is, I don't want to say cases, no case is not a priority because that's not the case, but that cases may rise to the top in terms of like we're going to run the DNA on this case and then we get another murder. And so that they, they fall back down to the, they fall, I don't want to say back down to the bottom, but they fall lower. Um, yeah, I would say the rapidity with which cases are processed is, is probably one of the big ones. Um, I think another one, and this isn't really a, this isn't really a, a forensic, um, a, it's not a misinterpretation of like forensic technique, but just getting into the forensic sciences. Um, I have a lot of students that just don't understand the importance of integrity and not having outstanding credit card debt and not having smoked funny cigarettes and things like that. Like, oh, it doesn't matter because I'm in college, they'll overlook it. And you know, on nights where you're working midnight shift alone and you're collecting $75,000 in cash from a search warrant, they wanna make sure that there's not any you know, propensity or any like you know, reason that you might take that money. I think, for me, I think that's the biggest you know, myth that I need to break is that no, you will not. You may as well change your major if you're if you're engaged in those kinds of activities. Um, what else? Go ahead. Well, that's a good question. So I think it. <clears throat> I'm still in the early stages of collecting roadkill and burying them in the woods. But um, so obviously in the spring, you're gonna have more decomposition than you are in, in the winter. Um, but the one thing that I wanna sort out is that even, so for example, I, I had a deer that, that I buried and I had looked at it over the course of about a year and then I was doing a forensic archaeology session, and I had students um, excavate it using archaeological techniques. So the deer isn't there anymore. But when I fly the drone over, I still pick up that grave. So I don't pick up the same heat signature as I did when the deer was in there, but I still can see it. And I think that is because that the soil matrix has been compromised. It's not as dense as it was. And I think it's a repository for water. I think like, you know, rain and so forth are getting in there. Um, so ultimately, yeah, there's gonna come a point where I would imagine that the ground is gonna be tamped down and we're no, no longer gonna see that. But, you know, I'm talking two and a half years later now and, you know, every couple months it, the, the signature becomes a little bit less obvious, but it's still there, it's still there. Another interesting thing, I also have ground penetrating radar, and that's another question about how long can you detect graves using GPR? Um, and so there have been some studies, I, I've used it on historic period cemeteries. Um, I haven't really used it on anything forensic. On the cemeteries though, they're pretty obvious because you've got people that are in caskets and if there's hardware, you'll get a, a ring from the metal. But um, there have been some studies where people have buried pigs and then gone back over a course of period of time and seen how, how long you can see these graves. The issue with finding graves with ground penetrating radar, if people don't know 
what it is. It's a, it's a signal that is sent from a, um, from a unit, and it sends a signal, a pulse, into the ground, and then there's a receiving antenna. And so if there's something that, that um, compromises that pulse wave, it's registered, and then you, you look at a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional printout. If you're looking for a grave, though, keep in mind GPR originally was used to find like pipes and things that are water lines and things along that line. Um, when you're looking for a grave, you have to have a really tight transect. You know, graves are hard to dig, so a lot of times people are balled up if you're looking for a child. If you don't have a transect that's going essentially right over that grave, that's not to say that the signal doesn't go out in sort of a, a bell-shaped fashion, because it does, but you, you literally have to have like 25 centimeter transects. That's tight, you'll be out there. You can't, you can't survey a huge area for a clandestine grave um, using ground penetrating radar. So that's where the drone comes in. It's nice if you can fly the drone, come up with an area that you think it might be, then you can go over it with GPR and see what the GPR signature looks like and see if it's a, a grave or not. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so I mean, we can still see it after two and a half years. Um, if the deer was still in there, it depends how, how deeply you have it buried. Um, so if you have things buried under roughly 12 inches, they're going to decompose pretty quickly. If you have them deeper than 12 inches, up to like, you know, two, two feet or so, three feet, um, you'll have decomposition that's occurring over a course of a couple of years for something as big as a deer. So, yeah. So do you mean like when you go out and see your first murder or things like that? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you, so um, when I was in, um, when I started working as a CSI, I had never seen a dead body that wasn't in a casket. And, um, and I thought, gosh, I've been in training for like, in the group that I came out with, we trained at the police academy, and so we were there for like four months. And I thought, all this training, and I still haven't been to the, to the morgue, I haven't been to the medical examiner's office, I haven't seen a, 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 a deceased individual, so, you know, what's this gonna be like? And so, um, <clears throat> one night, one of the people that, um, that was an active CSI, um, they were transitioning from being police officers to civilians, he was over at the academy with us, and he got a call for a, uh, a suicide. And I asked if I could go with him. And the anxiety that I had going there, like this is what I've wanted to do my whole life and my heart is beating out of my chest. And I'll tell you, when, you got, when we get in there, the radios, the police radios are going off, the camera, every time you take a picture, it goes meow, because it's recycling the battery. And it's almost like, it's almost like it is surreal. Um, if I were the person to find a, murder victim, I'd be the first one running down the street screaming my head off, like, out of fear. But it's almost like, it's almost like a shield, almost like a lens, because there's just so much activity. The paramedics are in and out, and the homicide detectives, and the radios are going off, and the cameras are making noises. Um, that's not to say that we don't all have, we were talking about this earlier today, we don't all have triggers, things that you just ruminate over. Um, I will say that for the majority of people that do this kind of work, there's a shelf that you just kind of put it on, and you put it on that shelf, and you just try not to revisit that shelf again. For me, I'm such an animal lover. Um, cases that I couldn't find a shelf for were always animal cases, dog fighting cases, animal abuse cases, um, things that people did to injure their animals. I just couldn't, and I would have to go home. Um, there are other people that couldn't handle children cases, and, and you know, and everybody, you work with you work with a group of people that every day you go to work and you are interacting with families, and it is the worst day of their life. Um, whether it be a, someone has died, or someone was assaulted, or even someone was burglarized, it's just a terrible invasion. And so we all have a camaraderie, and I, so people would know that I can't handle the animal stuff, and I would get a call, they would pick it up for me. And somebody would get a, a SIDS death, 
and um, I knew that they couldn't handle it, so I would pick that one up for them. So there's a, there's a, there's a back and forth. Do you ever get used to it? Um, I mean, that would just sound so inhuman if you got used to it. I don't think it's so much getting used to it, but you, um, you have a shelf. And let me tell you, we've hired people, and we actually changed the way that we did training because we hired people and put them through training like I went through, four months in training, and then you see your first body or you go to the morgue, and they lost it. They couldn't handle it, and they would quit. Like, uh-uh, I'm out of here. So um, at the time when I left, if we hired a new person, we would send them to the medical examiner's office like all week. Like, if you come back next Monday, then we'll train you. But we've had people that, um, you know, other triggers, one person, a, a um, individual that was deceased reminded her of her brother, and she quit right there, and the, took off all of her stuff in the parking lot and quit. Like, here it all is, I'm, I'm out of here, I'm not coming back. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's a matter of getting used to it, it's just being able to, to cope with it. And I'll just add one more thing to that, but being able to cope with it, like you think you can cope with it, but I don't know, I think that my personality changed over time where I became less empathetic, well, less sympathetic, I don't know, I just, I, I just become cold, I guess. Um, that's not even the right word, but it's my protective mechanism just to like become very clinical when something bad happens to someone that I love. Like, oh, you'll be all right. Like, just, just do this, do that, whatever. So anyway, um, what else? Go ahead. Oh, yeah, so serial numbers, absolutely. So people will switch tags all the time. So we'll write down a tag number, but we always check it against the VIN number, which is on the dashboard but sometimes they'll get rid of the VIN or they'll change the VIN. So we'll look at the engine block, which will have a serial number. Um, there are serial numbers hidden all throughout the car on the, on the door. When you open the door, there's a, a serial number or a VIN number. Absolutely, yep. Uh-huh. If they file it off. So we'll get the fire. Well, first of all, a vehicle has something like six places where the VIN is. So I know there's one on the engine block, there's one on the door, there's one on the dash. I think there's one behind one of the taillights in the back. They're all over the car. So um, we call them the RAT Squad, the Regional Auto Theft Task Force. The RAT Squad knows where all the VIN numbers are. If this person is smarter than your average criminal and has filed them all off, um, <clears throat> we'll get the firearms examiner who does serial number restorations. And uh, there's a number of different means. One is electrochemical etching. One is using an ultrasonic bath. One is using something called Magnaflux. And there's a bunch of different ways to bring back that um, eradicated or obliterated serial number. But, but interestingly, too, um, not only vehicles have serial numbers and not just TVs or bicycles, but hardware in bodies has serial numbers. So, so my ankle and my back have metal in them. Um, and so the serial numbers are for purposes of recall, but we can also use those serial numbers for means of identification. Um, breast implants have serial numbers. We had a, a case I didn't, I handled it. I wasn't involved in her identification, but as I was told, they ran the serial numbers on, she was decomposed, um, but had breast implants. They ran the serial numbers on the breast implants and came back with her, her identifying information pretty quickly. So um, tires have serial numbers, lots of things have serial numbers. The thing, the problem with serial numbers in people's houses though, and I'm just as guilty of it, you know, if somebody is burglarized, you'll say like, oh, did you, what is the serial number for your TV that was stolen? I never wrote it down. What about your, your iPhone? I never wrote it, I never wrote down any of my serial numbers either. So they have serial numbers, but part two of that is you have to record those serial numbers. <clears throat> and pawn shops, yeah, I don't know how it is here, but in Maryland, um, something like once a week, the burglary squad um, receives information from all of the pawn shops, things that have come in that week, and it's replete with serial numbers. So by taking stolen property to a pawn shop, it's not like that information isn't released to the police, because it is, it's released like once a week, assuming they're being honest and releasing it. 
What else? Go ahead. Oh, that's a good question. So um, when, when I'm using the radars, I think what you're talking about, it doesn't go very deep. So it's just looking at the, the top couple inches and where that heat is being transferred to the soil that's above. So it do, it's not like x-ray vision. Now the other radar, the ground penetrating radar, it looks like a lawnmower, that can go down pretty deep. Um, the unit that I have, because I'm looking for graves, I'm not trying to find you know, the mantle of the Earth's crust. Um, so mine, it goes down accurately about 12 feet, which is about you know, nine feet deeper than any bad guy's grave would ever be. Yeah, the MVAC. Yeah, so, so, so it depends on what state that you're in. In the past, um, we had a requirement for the admissibility of scientific evidence, and it was called the Fry test. And it was based upon the first polygraph. And to sum up the Fry test, it has to be considered generally accepted in the field. And so the question would be, is it generally accepted using the polygraph? Is it generally accepted that your blood pressure changes when you tell a lie? The problem with general acceptance is, who has to generally accept it? Is it cardiologists that generally accept it? Is it botanists who generally accept it? Like, who is the audience? And how many people have to generally accept it? Can I be like, hey, Bill, I'll slip you a 20 if you generally accept this. Oh, guess what, guys? It's generally accepted. And then, and then the other thing, and this kind of led to the undoing of that test, is that what if I have something really good that I know will be generally accepted, like DNA evidence, but I don't have it published. And so I get into this sort of lag period where I have good evidence, but it's not allowed into court because it's not generally accepted. And it's, it's not generally accepted, not because it's bad, it just hasn't gotten out there. So the courts came up with another rule, um, and it's called the Daubert Standard. And that one is much more lenient. It will allow things into court that might not be generally accepted, but as long as they prove that they've adhered to scientific methodology, they've got lab reports, it's, it's been peer reviewed, it's been presented. Um, <clears throat> and so in terms of the wet vac, I don't think it's, I think that DNA technology is more something that would be scrutinized than the actual technique of obtaining that DNA. So I have not heard that that has met any, any resistance. It's just, an, it's just another means of, if you will, swabbing DNA. Um, so I don't think that that's really, I don't think it's really, you know, been frowned upon. Now, the DNA technology and the analyst who's running the DNA, and do you clean the wet vac between uses and how well do you clean it? Now, that's all fodder for the, for the courts. But the actual wet vac, I haven't heard um, you know, anything about it. But, but I'll tell you, if you just keep your ears peer, you know, tuned in, you're going to hear more about that wet vac because I know of some some cases in Maryland, some cold cases, and they're wet vacking that evidence right, right now. And I'm, I pray that it brings resolution to some of these cases. <clears throat> yeah, my turn? The fun question? Well, thank you very much. Okay, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>